Um, my name is George, and I work for Gazelli Art House. Um, and what we do for every exhibition here is um, we do like sort of panel discussions that aren't necessarily um, talking directly about the artist's work, but taking sort of seeds of ideas from what the artists might be thinking about with their um, projects. So tonight, as a starting point for this discussion, we're taking Alinka Echevarria's um, project, M-Theory, uh, as a starting point. And uh, Alinka made these photographs um, as a result of visiting South Africa, meeting people that were imprisoned with Nelson Mandela in Robben Island, um, not just sort of fellow prisoners, but also prison guards uh, too, and um, a linker, um, as a result of her research trip for this series, decided to take the people that she had met's fingerprints and enlarge them and create these um, platinum uh, prints that we're looking at here. Um, so uh, tonight we're going to be talking um, a little bit about and thinking a little bit about the relationship between um, government and morality and what our rights are, potentially, as citizens, or what they actually are, uh, as citizens. And I guess that idea comes about because Alinka was um, kind of researching the apartheid, and I guess for some people, uh, apartheid is, is a sort of state-sponsored racism, uh, which I guess uh, many of us would agree is sort of morally uh, wrong. Uh, so, uh, we're going to explore this relationship between governments, uh, morality, and also learning more about the processes or systems um, that are linked with our human rights and uh, what, uh, what systems protect us from um, government, uh, I guess, government sort of intervention or something. But anyway, we're here to learn. We're here to sort of uh, learn more from our fabulous... Uh, panelists, and uh, I'm really very, very pleased uh, and honoured to welcome um, the panelists tonight. Uh, uh, to my right, I have uh, David Bellingham, who, uh, Dr. David Bellingham, if, if you don't mind, who is an art historian, uh, author, and programme director uh, of the master's degree at the um, Sotheby's um, Art Institute. Has also written a lot about ethics. Uh, we have Stephen Bowen. Uh, Stephen Bowen is the director of the British Institute of Human Rights. Uh, visiting Professor of Human Rights at Queen Mary University of London. Stephen has 25 years experience as an international human rights practitioner and has held a number of senior appointments with international human rights NGOs and the United Nations, most recently as Campaigns Director of Amnesty International. Uh, and on the end, we have Tessa Gregory. Uh, Tessa is an experienced litigator who specializes in international and domestic human rights law cases. 2011, Tessa was shortlisted for the Peter Duffy Young Human Rights Lawyer of the Year Award. In 2013, she was named the Times Lawyer of the Week. And in 2014, she featured in the Lawyer's Annual Hot 100 list, <laughs> which is like a hot list of, yeah, li a, a hot list of 100 lawyers. Um, and uh, yeah, so, that's, so thanks everybody for coming. Really appreciate uh, your time. And uh, I'd like to start off by asking uh, the question, uh, if we think about the idea that morality uh, is the sort of principles concerning the distinctions between right and wrong, in what way do governments promote or protect a moral code? And if they do, and I'd like to ask uh, Tessa that question, first of all. Um, well, I suppose it depends where you live and who your government is, but I, I think that government's job a government's role is to protect a moral code and one of the ways they do that is through the rule of law um, and that the rule of law should have a substantive conception of good and um, South Africa is a particularly interesting um, example and the, under the apartheid system where you have respect for a formal rule of law so it was very clear what the law was the um, government ministers would obey the law and they could be held to account by the law. Um, but the content of the law itself was discriminatory and um, 
did not respect human rights and people's basic entitlements. And to me, that is not the rule of law. The rule of law demands um, that people's basic human rights and entitlements are respected. Um, so I, I think that governments, and that's, that's a moral issue, um, it's right that those basic entitlements are respected and it's government's role to protect the vulnerable and ensure that um, those rights are not infringed. And um, uh, Stephen, uh, what's the sort of relationship between government and lawyers who represent people who may have been wronged uh, by governments? How does that sort of relationship work? If you could explain a little bit more about that. I think the starting point is really the, um, the rule of law and an understanding that human rights speak to a principle that no government is above the law and the law that no government is above is the international human rights law that is represented in things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so if that's what we mean um, by someone whose rights have been violated needing a lawyer, you are making the very simple point that unless, unless your human rights are protected by the law, they remain mere rhetoric. It is only when human rights are protected by the rule of law that you are able to say, my rights have been violated, my government has not, has not done its job of protecting my human rights. And often, whilst prevention is always better than a cure, often to make that claim, you need a lawyer. Um, like one of the lawyers at Lead A, who will actually argue your case and make sure that the government can be made to seem, to seem sense. So without the law, human rights can remain re mere aspiration. Interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so in a Linker's project uh, that we're looking at here, she's sort of illustrating, or she's using fingerprints uh, in one way to illustrate this idea that people are simultaneously unique and the same at the same time. Um, I wonder, do how do sort of human rights lawyers address or pr like protect this concept? Yeah, I think actually, um, with all due respect to Lee Day, I think we have to take human rights away from human rights lawyers. Okay. I'm a lawyer myself, I should say. I'm not nothing <laughs> against lawyers. Yeah. Um, what is unique about the idea of universal human rights? is that they are based on this profound but simple idea that every member of the human family is worthy of respect simply because they are human. Not because they're black, not because they're white, not because they're gay, not because they're straight, not because they're old, not because they're young, but because they're human. And not, and not because we are all the same. Universal human rights is about saying, actually, it is the natural human condition to be different. And actually to contest that difference, to have different ideas about different things. But human rights is built on the idea that we celebrate that difference and we find the thing which is precious in every single one of us, our, mm. our common humanity, the fact that we are here and we are human. And human rights law says that together we will protect. And protection of that, together, we will da demand from those governments who have power over us. Because human rights, ultimately, are about the power of governments over us. Yeah, and I think that once they're enacted, they should give us the freedom to celebrate our differences and live our lives in the ways we want to. Which may be, you know, we may have very different conceptions of what a good life is like. But with the protections in place, they give people the space to pursue those ideas and dreams. So do you think that a human rights... We have a, we have a human rights act that we'll go into a little bit later. Hopefully you can sort of explain a little bit about what the human rights act is. Um, it, is a human rights act, do you think that realistically can be globally applied to all cultures? Or is it more specific, sort of, specifically a Western kind of creation? Well, it's not the Human Rights Act which is applied to all cultures. It's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was born out of the horrors of the Second World War and a coming together of the human family to say, we will proclaim what rights every one of us have 
by being human. Now, it is those rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which via um, the European Convention of Human Rights, are made the law of the land here at home through the Human Rights Act. So it's not so much applying the Human Rights Act to the rest of the world. The question rather is celebrating how the Human Rights Act makes universal human rights the law to protect us here at home and everywhere. Mm. And there are certain norms which are recognised as being what's known as just cogens, and that's accepted to apply to all states in all places. So something right. like the right to be free from torture, um, that is accepted as being an international norm which can be shared. There's mm. other more qualified rights, which I think you can see in different cultures, may be weighed up differently. So we have a very individualistic outlook in the West, which perhaps other um, states may take a different view when they're weighing up how one right competes against the other. Right, okay. I just want to bring, um, uh, uh, I just want to bring David into this discussion, because you've been slightly sort of left out at the moment, and talk a little bit about um, art and the history of art. And um, I want to talk about the freedom of speech <coughs> and how um, art historically has been used um, potentially by governments or by um, patrons mm. to communicate ideas about freedom of speech and what problems might uh, occur from that concept. Yeah, I mean, starting with um, Linker's works that were are in the, the behind us, uh, seated here, um, I think that they, they demonstrate the, the power of art to be kind of multi-semantic and to speak about... Um, aesthetics, if you like, on a primary level, it's that that makes us look at the art and then get involved with the ideas, be it a, a literary text, a beautiful poem or a beautiful piece of music. It attracts the, us into the work and then we hopefully, link, I'm sure a linker will be expecting us to kind of then um, also swallow the kind of um, ideological ideas and political and moral ideas at the same time. Mm. So, you know, the, the, these images are, I'm sure you all agree, they're, they're all very beautiful. They, they, they're a series of works, a um, little bit like looking at, you know, Monet's Haystacks and Notre Dame at different stages of the, sorry, Rouen Cathedral at different stages of the day. So they're definitely a kind of art, a kind of modern art historical tradition. Um, but they also, um, when we when we think about what they're representing, uh, they they represent the um, the unique individuality, as you say, of the human being. But they all look more similar than different at the same time. Um, and, of course, the other thing that they remind us of historically is, uh, you know, this year celebrating the, um, however many centuries it is, of the Magna Carta. Um, and this is very um, much in the news at the moment because of David Cameron's wanting to pull out of the European Bill of Human Rights. Mm. And it's, he's been using the rhetoric of the Magna Carta to, you know, to, as a kind of bandwagon idea. It reminds us that when the Magna Carta was, was written, um, you know, one of the things it didn't do was talk about individual person, the rights for our personal um, freedoms and not to be, um, uh, for our, uh, a right to have personal secrets and so on. And, and in some ways, I think the difference today is surely to do with, um, you know, with this sort of thing, the ability to photograph and to record and we walk down the street, there's CCTV cameras looking at us everywhere. At the time of the Magna Carta, I guess that wasn't such a big issue, that's all. Uh, it'd be quite interesting to hear your, your views on that. Mm. But um, I was just going to remind, uh, just as an example of, um, of the artist, I, um, and I can think of many. Um, um, someone like Chris, Chris Ophelia, I'm thinking of, who, who produced um, uh, a painting of the Holy Virgin Mary. So we have also this notion of, re you know, maybe religion will come into this discussion tonight as another way of, um, of, of, of another suggestion um, of, uh, of, of moral codes, you know, as opposed to, say, secular moral codes, post-Kantian. Um, but, you know, he's a practicing Roman Catholic. He produced a, a, a now famous image of the Holy Virgin Mary, which I notice is famous again on the art market, is about to be sold at auction this summer. And um, when it, it was famously first shown um, at Sensations Exhibition of the Royal Academy uh, and uh, created some controversy there, but when the exhibition was taken to Brooklyn Museum, um, Rudolf Giuliani, who you remember was seen as a, as a good thing as a, by many people in New York, as clearing up New York, you know, and, 
uh, the cutting down on, on crime and muggings, etc. Uh, when he saw it, he just referred to it as sick stuff. Mm. Um, and um, his opponent, his political opponent, um, Hillary Clinton, um, also referred to it as the painting as objectionable. The reason they thought it was objectionable because it used elephant dung, it was a black Madonna, although of course they couldn't actually say that, I think it was implicit. Um, and as you got close to it, it had lots of um, photographic images, pornographic images of women incorporated into the Madonna. So you could see why they responded like that. Um, and Hil Hillary Clinton, um, you know, she said, uh, um, but she thought, because Giuliani said, threatened to actually withdraw fundings from the Brooklyn Museum, Hillary Clinton thought he was going too far, but still thought it was objectionable. But what mm. was interesting is that their discourse had, they didn't get into any kind of dialogue about, with the artist about that. And when Chris Ophelia was interviewed, he, I'd just quite like to quote him, he said, um, because I think this is, this is typical of the artist's response to this kind of censorship, um, he said, the church is not made up of one person, but a whole congregation. And of course, that's one of the differences, I think, between religion as a moral code and what one might call subversive ethics, where, where individual kind of autonomous groups challenge the power of a dominant ideology. Basically, and we can see this in the photographs around the corner by Alinka, um, all of those, those images of police and so on that are part of the new South Sudan government, itself surely a good thing, you know, 69 tribes that have always been fighting one another come together as one nation, but the only way they can actually maintain that peace is by implicit violence. And yeah. um, I, I, guess, I guess what religions are trying to do is suggest that it's like a, it's a subversive ethic, but it's basically saying that we can't have individual groupings, we've all got to come together as one. Mm. So it seems to me in Alinka's work around the corner and here, um, we've, we've got a, 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 a photograph of a, of, a, of a group of young women, and it's called Anthem, and this is the creation of the first national anthem, which again is drawing together those different tribes into one community. We all know that national anthems are kind of ideological as well. So, um, but uh, as I say, the images of the police, they're wearing, they're, they're, they're military police. Um, they're wearing camouflage. So although they're policing and, and imposing the law um, as policemen, they're actually quasi-military as well. And I think that that is the problem with, with, with politicians and governments trying to impose laws, is that we see it on the streets of London as well, that there's mm. always the, imp the implicit thing is you're free, uh, but it's controlled by the implication that violence will be used if you go too far. Mm. And in the, in the, as I understand it, in the, in the Bill of Human Rights, you can actually... Um, you, you can actually use violence so long as it's um, a reasonable response to what's going on, you know, the poll tax riots and so on. So it, it seems to me this, that, that we can't take religion out of the argument. It's still a big factor sure. in our world, as we all know, what's happening in the world at the moment. So yeah. Yeah. I think that I don't know how human rights fits in with religion and, you know, and, and laws that governments have... Yeah, because I was going to I was going to sort of expand on that a little bit actually, and and the difficulty of kind of legislating or managing um, um, the right for to free speech versus um, uh, speech which incites violence or hatred, and I don't know how do you guys kind of navigate that? Because it can't be, I mean, is, is there sort of like a universal law that like covers that or you allow a speech that maybe incites violence or hatred because that is the right to free speech and what that sort of uh, loop creates, I guess? Yeah, I mean, free speech is a great um, example of what universal human rights both is and can achieve. And the difference between human rights and what many of us are sometimes more familiar with in terms of, say, civil liberties or whatever um, Magna Carta is meant to, meant to represent. Because, I mean, I mean your, your right to free speech, in a sense, is qualified by where everyone else's right mm -hmm. to free speech um, begins, yeah? And so um, the question, is there a universal law? Yes, in, in the universal law that is human rights law, um, Freedom of speech is recognised as a very, very precious human right, which is sometimes, but only in extremis, subject to legitimate interference. Mm. That legitimate interference has to serve a legitimate purpose. It has to be subject to the law. 
It has to be non-arbitrary, and it has to be on very closely defined grounds, one of which would be to protect others from violence. Now, mm. um, that's actually a strength of international human rights, because human rights have to live in the real world. And in the real world, speech is powerful, art is powerful. Speech and art have driven movements of national liberation and struggles against oppression. And in Rwanda, Radio Rwanda and the hate they spewed out is widely believed to have made a massive difference to the scale of the slaughter in the Rwandan genocide. So in the real world, speech is powerful mm. and it cannot be understood to be an absolute entitlement of anyone to use any kind of speech in any forum to incite violence and remove the rights of others. It can't be conceptualised in that way. At the same time, um, those of us who um, work in the field of protecting human rights, the human right to free speech in the courts of law have to sadly recognise that governments routinely um, interfere where no interference is necessary. Mm. So it's a delicate balance. But conceptually, um, human rights, if you like, provides the lens through which to look at the question what curtailment of our precious right to free speech is legitimate and how and when does it become illegitimate. That's almost the, the common good which human rights provides. And without that, I think, we are left, sadly, with um, free speech being protected only by gut instinct. Hmm. And yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the limitations on, I mean, Article 10 on, on um, freedom of expression I know quite well because it's what most affects artists, and uh, the limitations include the protection of morals, and that begs mm. the question, you know, what are the morals and whose mm. morals are they? And that's what Chris Ophelia was basically saying, that he said that it was something else trying to control him as an artist and that his congregation have a right to, to respond to that work of art in different ways. You know, it shouldn't just be one political person um, you know, uh, saying how we should interpret the work. Yeah, I mean, as I think the right to free speech is a kind of classic example where human rights, um, the, the two different rights will compete and there'll be an interface. And I think in a pluralistic liberal society, then it, it's often the harm principle which is applied. Mm. You know, you have a right to say what you want as long as you don't do real harm to somebody else. And so you can't incite violence. Although, of course, that incitement of violence has to be from a reasonable person. You know, I might have somebody opposite who gets incited to do a violent act if I say the word red. That's not going right. to prevent me saying the word red. But if I incite somebody, and the Rwandan genocide is a, is a, a classic a example of that, to actually commit these, these violent acts, then <coughs> that, that's not necessarily protect, that's not a protected right for me to do that. And that's where the state can interfere um, and in the same way that freedom of assembly the state will interfere if national security is um, jeopardized but again right. we know that they interfere with that right um, much more leniently and liberally than than you'd want them to yeah because I was going to talk about like it sort of feels a little bit like there's two camps you've got the hu you've got human rights and then you've got government and the two groups are sort of separate and uh, in Article 8 of the Human Rights Act, it says everyone has the right to, re to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. And yet that seems to sort of conflict with recent stories that have come out about GCHQ monitoring people's um, correspondence, emails, telephone conversations and things like that. So I guess what I'm interested in is who in that situation is like policing the police if you like, what's, well, what's it, that it, process about? It ought to be Parliament. There ought right. to be parliamentary oversight of any kind of interference with people's right to um, a private life and correspondence. But in the case that you're talking about with GCHQ, who have been spying and the surveillance system that's mm. set up, that there is no real parliamentary oversight. And so in that case, I think the, lo the rule of law is jeopardized because mm. you have agents of the state who are acting and interfering with people's rights without being held to account um, and without any checks and balances. And in my opinion, that's extremely dangerous. 
Yeah, and who is who's sort of on the side of the citizens to challenge those organisations? How does that? How would that process work? Would I need to um, uh, say I felt that my emails were being um, read by another organisation? What would I do to? Well, challenge you, you that organisation. You can make a complaint, but we've got a very difficult situation here in that if you have a complaint where you feel your rights are infringed and they've been infringed by the security services, then rather than go to an ordinary court where all the evidence will be um, for you to see and for the other side to see and for journalists and the public to see, you'll have open justice, you have to go to something called the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, right. which is... It's it's not real justice, and okay. it's um, it's kind of spook run and led, and it doesn't provide proper oversight. So, in my opinion, we have in this area a mm. real lacuna. Interesting. So, do you think this this sort of separation between human rights and government fosters a kind of mistrust of um, the government in people? Generally, what do you think? What do you think about that? I mean, where does that leave us? You know, I'm sort of thinking maybe in more grand terms about post Enlightenment era, um, where the pursuit of knowledge was about truth, and that was like a good thing. And it sort of feels like we're in an era now of a like post modernist thing, where everything is questioned, including the people that are supposed to be like protecting us. Um, so, does, so do, are we in a sort of slightly mistrustful environment when it comes to citizens and government? Uh, as a result of, of, of those things. I think we should always be in a mistrustful environment yeah. in some ways. We have to, and that's part of the relationship between individuals and the states, and that's mm -hmm. why we have something like the Human Rights Act to ensure that the state don't overstep the mark and are held to account. Um, and I think that that's healthy. You know, mm. the Human Rights Act is particularly to protect our rights against public authorities, um, and that might be companies exercising public authorities, which increasingly they are as services get contracted out. But, um, you know, we need, we need that. There's always been abuses mm. of power, and there always will. I don't think that's a, a new thing. I think, as you said, with technology changing, mm. um, we have different... But there's, there's, I, also, yeah. there's also a hypocrisy with, with, with you know, government committees um, bringing in Murdoch and, you know, exposing his, um, you know, the bugging of phones for journalistic media, you know. I mean, that was, that was obvious. And yet, at the same time, those government structures are apparently doing the same thing. It's only exposed mm. when it's another group in society, it seems to me. Mm. I just had one, just before, in case we move on, mm. I had one example of, you, you were saying, how does, how does an individual challenge this? And that is a game where artists can become very powerful. And I, I have an example, one of our um, one of our current research students at Sotheby's Institute I was speaking to today, uh, Valeria, and she's studying an art, for her uh, dissertation, she's studying a Spanish artist who lives in Barcelona called Nuria Guel. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And um, she, basically, this is her mission, I analyse ethics practised by the institutions that govern us, detecting abuses of power conducted by the established legality and hegemonic morality. Both function as control strategies that dominate the collective subjectivity and affect our patterns of behaviour, thinking and our sense. And the way she challenges this is that she says she analyses legal or moral principles and applies them in the opposite direction by reversing the power relationship, a kind of deconstruction. Um, mm. And one of the things, for example, that she did was called Humanitarian Aid Public Service Cuba España where for five years she used to offer herself as a bride to, to any Cuban man who wanted to emigrate to Spain, covering the wedding and the plane ticket expenses. Wow. How many so, times did she get married? I think, well, you, <laughs> yeah. Va Valeria, just could, yeah, just once. once as a, but what is interesting about that is it sounds crazy, but I think that, again, shows the power that art can have. Mm. Um, particularly now it's so high in the media. You know, media is very interested in stories about art, as been the Athelie. So I think artists are people who can stand up and represent the rest of us who otherwise feel rather kind of powerless in these situations. Yeah. That's yeah, super interesting. Um, uh, just leaving that to one side for a sec, you talked about the, um, uh, the Human Rights Act, and there was uh, been recently been stuff in the news about a thing called the British Bill of Human Rights. 
and how that might be different from the Human Rights Act. Um, I don't know, Stephen, perhaps, maybe you can explain a bit about what's going on there for, for those of us who've been reading about it but don't quite understand the intricacies of what those two different acts are. Well, I suppose probably the best way to understand the very curious situation we are now in in this country is um, imagine President Obama went to the nation of the United States pledging to scrap the First Amendment. Yeah? The, um, this government got itself elected on a little-known <coughs> pledge to scrap the Human Rights Act and to replace it with a what they call a British Bill of Rights. But they've made clear in their various announcements, which we've been tracking over the last um, nine and a half years, that um, what they plan is a rather sort of dismal, homemade DIY version and not what we already have in the Human Rights Act, which is already a Bill of Rights, which protects all of your human rights um, against the government. The, um, the Human Rights Act protects all of you when the government crosses the line and goes too far. Your right to free speech, your right to freedom of assembly, your right to be free from torture, your right mm. to private and family life and more. All of these rights are protected by the Human Rights Act. So it's a rather astonishing thing for the government to be um, now, I don't know whether the word really is threatening or promising us actually, to um, be scrapping that Human Rights Act and be replacing it with a British Bill of Rights. They've, um, they've told us quite clearly, they published um, a paper back in um, October. Um, they had the audacity to publish it on the um, 14th anniversary of the Human Rights Act. <laughs> um, they, um, they said the Bill of Rights will not will not protect any new rights. So there we already have um, the normal reason for changing human rights legislation all around the world ever since 1948 and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The normal rationale for changing the laws that protect us from government yeah, would be to protect more rights. So they've already promised no more rights. They promised that. Yeah? They, um, they apparently want to clean up the system. Yeah? They want to... Um, stop trivial cases being seen as human rights cases. Now, that sometimes strikes people as reasonable and fair until you ask yourself, you know, who decides what is trivial? Yeah? Mm. I'm looking around this room, yeah? Um, there's quite a few women in this room. 148 years ago, you weren't allowed to own property on your own. Yeah? And if you'd claimed in court that I want to own my own house, that would have been seen by those in power with vested interest to be um, a trivial claim, yeah? Um, I'm a gay man, and more recently than 147 years ago, my claim not to be put in prison because of who I love, yeah, would have been seen as a trivial claim. Yeah? Mm. So actually, behind the idea that the government is going to decide what human rights claims are trivial is actually something quite dangerous. Mm. I, would, I would suggest you don't get hoodwinked by that, really. Yeah? They're, also, they're also going to do something to stop the system, as they call it, being abused. And they particularly have in their sights what they describe as um, foreign criminals, who they say have um, been able to use the protection of their human rights to prevent their deportation. And again, I'd ask you to think about whether that really is what we want the government to do, to change the law so that certain people are no longer protected by human rights. Mm. Because the minute you take human rights away from people on the basis of who they are or what they have done, no longer do you have human rights because human rights are what you have simply because you are human. They're not the gift of the government to give us or take away. And um, I'm sure most of us in this room believe that if people commit horrible crimes, they should be properly pu punished and that should no doubt include lengthy prison sentences and so on. But to design a system of human rights laws, yeah, that tries to exclude some members of the human family from mm. protection of the law, this cannot be, will never be human rights, yeah? I'm reminded of that famous, famous poem which drew on the experience of the Nazi era. You could paraphrase it. First they came for the foreign criminals but I wasn't a foreign criminal, so I did nothing. Yeah? So they promised to take human rights away from people who are unpopular. And of course, that's really the rub of it. The rub of it is that, um, yes, foreign criminals are unpopular. 
Actually, gypsy traveller families are unpopular as well, and none of us would want a gypsy traveller family to suddenly encamp on the village green in our little town or village, of course, yeah? Um, but actually, who is unpopular in a democracy yeah, is one of the things that human rights must always protect, because otherwise you have what de Tocqueville and others have called the, um, the tyranny of the majority. So their proposals are indeed for a Bill of Rights, but everything they have published and everything they have said suggests it will seek to achieve really only one major purpose, to distance this country from the universal human rights system that has been put in place with great pain, but also great energy and daring to ensure that the horrors of the Second World War could never be repeated which is why my little charity is uh, implacably opposed to them being allowed to do this. And I think, actually, if we work together, we can stop them doing it. Hmm. Yeah, I com completely agree. And uh, it seems to me that coupled with vicious legal aid cuts, which are really threatening people's access to justice, this idea of um, scrapping the Human Rights Act uh, is just serving to leave a whole load of vulnerable people unprotected and executive action um, unchecked. You know, the government don't like the Human Rights Act because it holds them to account. Um, and they publicize very unpopular stories about foreign criminals, but it also protects people who don't get enough care in hospital, victims of trafficking, soldiers who are put into military combat situations without the right equipment. Um, and one of the things they, they want to do with their Bill of Human, with their British Bill of Rights as well, is to restrict the applicability of the um, rights just to the UK. So many of the cases I've worked on have involved investigating the abuse and torture of Iraqis when we were involved in a war in Iraq. Um, and human rights protections have been found to apply um, in military bases in Iraq and when there's effective control by the British military. And that's been very important and brought to light cases like Baha Musa, who was killed after 96 um, hours in UK detention and he had multiple injuries all over his body after being subjected to banned techniques, which were meant to have been banned in 1972 after Ireland. Things like food deprivation, stress positions, sensory deprivation. Um, and without the Human Rights Act, none of that would have come into um, account, and there was a, a full inquiry which has led to reform of military practice and procedure, which should have happened after these techniques were banned in 1972, but had continued to be practiced um, by the British military in, their, um, in, in wars abroad. So I think it is undoubtedly the case that whatever the British Bill of Rights is, it's going to be a weaker form which will um, allow the government to act unchecked, and I, I don't think that's, that's a good thing. Hmm. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about narrative and how um, uh, na uh, uh, sort of morality and narrative have a relationship together, and what um, government action, what our government actions abroad might be doing to promote a particular moral code to uh, the indigenous population, for, uh, for example, us. So I guess bringing morality back into this, there's uh, um, this sort of narrative uh, it is often kind of relayed to us in very simple terms about like right and wrong. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so how do government actions abroad promote or um, yeah, promote a sort of moral code to its indigenous people, i.e. us? Um. <laughs> <laughs> we have a long question. But, yes. Uh, um, yeah. Well, I think the starting point might be that the moral duty of government is perhaps to live up to its international human rights obligations in what it does abroad and to implement them back at home. And so to that mm. extent, I think we can't deny 
recognising, for good or for bad, that the way the government behaves, the way it describes the rationale for its behaviour, in particular when it's involved in foreign affairs, yeah, um, both reflects, mirrors and influences the narrative back at home. Mm. Yeah? Um, I think when we look back at the recent uh, military adventurism, I think it could be called, of the United Kingdom government, yeah, with um, a number of military interventions, some of which um, have um, quite manifestly created as much harm as they try to seek, and others of which have um, proved very successful. Yeah? Um, the, most, the most critical question to me is, what is it that legitimates this military adventurism? Yeah? What is it that legitimates the United Kingdom venturing forth and using military might outside mm -hmm. our own borders? And surely the only thing which can legitimate that would be the protection of, of human life and dignity. Yeah? So, although it seems possibly a lawyer's answer, you can see that when the United Kingdom acts abroad with the full backing of the world community through the United Nations Security Council, and is at least therefore acting lawfully, yeah? mm. that is one scenario. When the United Kingdom steps outside that system of regulation and international comity, then um, the influence back home on the narrative is very different, I think, really. Yeah? Mm. It's very shameful, I think, because um, interestingly, for someone who's always introduced as being kind of a, <laughs> some kind of <laughs> professor of human rights law here in the UK, I've actually spent quite a lot of my life in, um, in UN peacekeeping missions. And so um, I've been in the former Yugoslavia in the middle of a genocidal war and seen the international community trying to grapple with whether or not the use of military might is absolutely necessary or not mm. to prevent a genocide. I've seen the international community sit by and let the genocide unfold in Rwanda when most people think a little bit of military might would have actually addressed it very substantially. So these are real issues that we cannot go back two or three hundred years to a point where we claim as Citizen, people of the UK and citizens of the world that what goes on in distant shores is no concern of ours. But equally, we can't go it alone and flout the rules and invade other countries without some kind of lawful mandate. So we've come to a situation now where what was, what was building yeah, mm -hmm. internationally as a collectivized sense that sovereignty of states was no longer all about power, but it was about responsibility. And it included, it included responsibility to reach out and protect the people of other countries when their lives were not being protected by their own government. Yeah? And that that, sanctioned by the world coming together in the United Nations, would be an option of last resort. Yeah? That's what the world thought we had learned from the dismal experience of Rwanda and Yugoslavia, but the adventurism of Iraq has damaged that considerably. Mm. It, will probably take, it will probably take a generation to rebuild it. So in answer to your question directly, when the government behaves illegally abroad, it damages the narrative and the thoughtfulness mm. by which we all try to grapple with these truly difficult questions enormously. And for that, we pay a heavy price. Also, in the recent general election, um, it was very obvious, even in the TV debates, um, there was nothing about foreign policy, or very little. Mm. So this isn't part of the political discourse in this country at the moment, it seems to me, anyway. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I think mm. it, it's become, well, Britain's become much more inward-looking. Mm. And you can see that with the, the, you know, the wish to pull out of mm. Europe. Um, mm. And I think some of that on the poli foreign policy front is because of the disaster that was Iraq. Um, and so we, we very much... Mm. And, you know, it's an interesting time to be becoming like that and looking more and more inward as the power shifts across mm. the world with China becoming much more powerful. The idea mm. that we now pull out of mm. Europe and become a, a, mm. a country on our own, it's, it's, a, it's really interesting times. 
Yeah, I mean, we've covered a lot tonight. There's a lot of complex things going on that we're talking about, but I wonder whether we can open up um, and have a bit of a Q&A from, from the audience and maybe get some questions from people that are picking up on some of the things we've been talking about. Oh, yeah, we've, we've got a mic that uh, uh, yeah, you need to speak into. Uh, oh, where are you? What's the first yeah, oh, sorry, 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 I didn't see that. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, with regards to the panel, do they not believe then in the legal system in the UK? Because normally in a democracy, you, you uh, vote for the government and they implement their manifesto and then the laws are passed and then the courts interpret accordingly. Are you saying with regards to human rights, you, you don't trust the courts of the land or what exactly are you, you know, complaining about? I know, I do, I do trust the, the courts of the land right. and um, a lot of the cases I bring are judicial reviews where you challenge a, a government decision and you go to the court and you might say that this is unlawful because it's breaching human rights or this is, I, I acted in one case um, about the institution of the workfare regulations where those regulations were outside the power conferred on the government by parliament. Um, but in, in the particular respect I spoke of, the lacuna is complaints involving the security service. I don't think we have a strong court system or system of account for those national security questions that go to um, a, a specific tribunal. I, I also think that Parliament has passed legislation, further legislation in relation to national security issues which allow for what's known as a closed procedure in our ordinary courts where um, the claimant's representative is not able to see large swathes of the evidence because only people who are security cleared can. And uh, I think in that respect, that, that, that's not a fair system. And um, what the, the statute which Parliament has enacted it is, is not consistent really with a right to fair trial. Sorry, Although just, the European Court hasn't found that. And just, sorry, one last question. If there's, a, if there's a referendum on something, like in Ireland recently about uh, gay marriage, if the same thing happened in Uganda and the country voted for outlawing gay marriage, for example, is, the, is it the will of the people which is more relevant or the universal declaration of human rights? Because everyone keeps on talking about democracy, you talk about human rights, there's always inconsistency sometimes within that. So which, you know, it's, it's easy to talk on a panel, but where do you stand on these particular issues? Because it's always at the margin where the problems occur. Everyone would say, yes, everyone needs human rights, but if those human rights breach my right to life and I get killed by a mom, I have a right to live as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm more concerned about that than my right to privacy or some snooping by GCHQ. So can you please mm. attend, you know, talk about those specific things? Um, I hope none of you will be surprised that I'm more concerned about my right to life as well than a bit of snooping by GCHQ. And I'm very passionate about human rights because actually human rights places an ob a very, very powerful obligation on governments to protect our right to life. And that actually sometimes you know, requires the government, I think, to snoop on you're some not, people. But yeah? you've not talked so, about that no. on, on your panel, have you? Well, I did talk about that actually when I talked about the balance in freedom of, freedom of speech and how there needed to be a balance struck. But your, your question about Uganda and homosexuality in a referendum here. Um, one history of human rights traces the journey, well, one journey takes it back to Magna Carta, but that's a whole different question. But the more recent journey takes it back to the Enlightenment and the American mm. Bill of Rights and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen and so mm. on. And all of that is wrapped up in a conception of democracy that um, a functioning rights-protecting society is only about government representing the will of the people. And in fact, modern human rights is the next step beyond that because modern human rights is built on that wisdom of the ages but also what we learned from the Second World War when the Nazi government got itself elected using the levers of democratic power. It brought in the Nuremberg laws that started the process, not the first laws that homosexuals are not human, but the Jews could not own property. Yeah? So actually, 
I have a very, very immediate answer to your question. If, which I doubt very much, the people of Uganda in a referendum voted to criminalise homosexuality and the government did it, it would be a shocking and clear violation of international human rights law, which says no government can decide which human beings have human rights and which do not. And that mm. slightly different version of democracy and national sovereignty is absolutely what makes human rights fit for this modern, globalised, complex age in which we now live. Any more questions? Yes. Um, first, just a comment um, and then a question. Um, as you can tell, I'm American and I um, just have a slightly different slant maybe about um, Chris O'Feely's Black Madonna. Um, mm. I would just suggest that I don't think it had to do with the race of the Madonna. There have been black Jesus in art in America and all that sort of thing. I think it was just, uh, not just, I think it was mostly the elephant dung and the pornography that, um, quote unquote, offended sensibilities. Um, not that America doesn't have a no, lot I, of race <coughs> issues. I would, agree, um, I, would, I would agree with that. The trouble okay. is it gets pulled into the, the midst of the discussion. Mostly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and in terms of a question and sort of um, related to Germany and, and those laws, um, do you think that um, economics uh, is more of a determinant these days in terms of the individual's interest in human rights outside of their own borders from the standpoint that when there's high unemployment, when they feel schools are substandard, people aren't being properly educated, the NHS is falling apart, do you think people are looking at their own um, immediate needs uh, and not wanting um, tax dollars spent overseas and sort of in tandem with that, do you think there's a weariness in looking at so much foreign aid that is supposed to help human rights that seems to be squandered through um, misappropriation, bribery, um, graft, corruption, etc. in so many of these countries where it is supposed to be doing good. So I guess my question would be, do you think economics is playing a large role um, in people's lack of concern for mm. human rights elsewhere? Mm. Um, yeah, I guess it is, but it's quite de that's quite depressing, isn't it? I mean, because we'd, I, guess, um, I guess what we've been discussing is this idea of human rights being a kind of an ideological position, a philosophical position, really. And, uh, and the promotion of, of that philosophy is something that um, it probably has a fiscal price, but then the, the sort of cost of like sharing that idea, I mean, what, what, you know, how saying, much does I'm, that cost? I'm not I saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying, yeah. do you think that... People get I weary, yeah, and they get, they get sort of depressed about the idea that money's being spent abroad when um, there's, you know, unemployment, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, and I think without, you know, if people can't afford to eat, and if people are relying on food banks, then they're not going to be, they're going to be concerned about their own welfare. And actually, all these rights don't really mean that much if people that can't afford the basic things in life and don't have access to the basic things in life. But the idea, I think, that we can then just turn inwards and not worry about the world outside is, is mad. And you see that with the current crisis in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Because we're such an interlinked world, people are... Mm you know, it's going to impact on us. And yet Britain is saying they don't want to take any of the refugees and Italy has mm. so many and sort of mentioning... Me right if I can just finish Wait. one other thing and just going back to the politics and, and uh, party platforms in the most recent election, I have to say that since Claire Short faded out of the, um, mm. off the scene as overseas development um, director or whatever, um, I haven't heard a peep out of that particular cabinet, sub-cabinet office. So I think it's all very indicative of people's priorities. Yeah, and maybe the current government. In answer, whether the, were you asking whether the Human Rights Act protects? It, it doesn't. The thing that would protect them is the Refugee Convention, which applies, which is a, another international human rights instrument that applies across the world. But, I mean, we, 
it, it, it's not incorporated into our domestic legislation and it's not until people reach the UK that really the UK's responsibilities um, kick in um, on how to treat these people, So, which is how you've got the situation now where the UK is washing its hands and saying we don't mm. want to assist and we're refusing to take a quota of people and you have the countries at the front line who are having to shoulder because it's where they first, their boats happen. Am I right in saying, pardon mm. my naivety, but am I right in saying that it's not in the Bill of Human Rights the right to eat? And I well, don't think it's no. there. I think it assumes that we have those things. Mm. Well, it depends where we are in the world, here in London, mm. Europe, mm. internationally. I mean, the great promise of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is summed up as freedom from fear mm -hmm. and freedom from want. And the idea that everyone has a human right to the basics of human sustenance, the right to health, the right to education, the right to an adequate standard of living is very much part and parcel of what we talk about when we talk about human rights. Here in the United Kingdom, the Human Rights Act protects only a much more limited um, but very important um, collection of civil and political rights. Yeah? But um, they have been shown to protect also those who are rendered very vulnerable. Um, so our Supreme Court has argued has decided in many cases that um, those who are left utterly destitute by um, government laws that try to remove aid from asylum seekers and people who have their claims turned down have the right to be given basic sustenance. So, but it's a um, high threshold. It's a very it? high, threshold. Very high um, threshold. Could I come back also to the question about the people, um, the people dying in, um, in the Mediterranean? Um, because... Um, when we talk about human rights, whether it's the Human Rights Act or the Universal Declaration or the European Convention on Human Rights, um, it is the law which holds the government to account for their actions. It is what protects all of us. Yeah? But um, it is also the people's law. And I think that we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, repeat what I believe is a myth that people are no longer supportive of human rights. We are at the British Institute of Human Rights. Our phone rings off the hook from people who ask us the question, what can we do to help? And actually, all of us have a role in talking to our political leaders and demanding that they do rescue those people before they die. I'm really mm. tired, as I'm sure many of you are, of hearing those news reports that there's some great policy conference. They need some new convention on this, some new rule about tackling the perpetrators, a new licensing scheme for the boats off the coast of Libya. Whilst we speak, people are dying. They are drowning because the world will not protect their basic right to life. And actually, that is a message which we need to get to our political mm -hmm. leaders because actually, I believe too many of us believe that, but too few of us speak up, yeah. speak calmly, but speak loudly. So never forget that human rights is all about empowering us, not only to take our political leaders to court, but tell them what we think and to demand justice. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Go yeah, ahead. Oh, Jackson. he's just there. Yeah. Oh, he's just oh. pointing out. Huh? Sorry, I thought he oh, was just good. pointing. Okay. Yeah. I'm Italian. I come from Sicily, in fact. Uh, uh, I want to say the situation of the Mediterranean, which in this country they never acknowledge the responsibility of Britain in particular, mm -hmm. in the case of Libya. We, we know, I know before it was not the case. Libya was protecting us under Gaddafi. Uh, uh, Libya was a very ordered country. Uh, of course, Gaddafi was authoritarian, but the, was the best of the lot. The fact Britain made this mess in Libya. Britain, alongside the US, they're not taking any responsibility, so it's political. Now, not only that, they just remove, they don't want to take in what they created. The, to protect what the damage they've done. Libya is no way forever, basically. They destroy a country. In the sense, I heard, they say Syria, from Syria, hardly you hear in the news. They are all from Libya, a lot of people which, they can't live in the country. There are millions now. And it's a very violent country in the mess, lost forever. Mm. So, so, this, you, so you think there's a lack of sort of support specifically from Britain? Given yes, no, it should be the first support, but there should be a responsibility to have a great in the first place. That. Yeah, so they should be. 
Yeah. Right. And so, certainly the BBC never ever not to help, to not to help. Source of that problem. They should mm. solve the problem they create. Yeah. Mm. No, you're quite right, yeah. and it's yeah. not ever Sounds spoken good. about on the news. We just mm. talk about these the people. The problem from, is yeah. the direct responsibility on the background, of course, it's the US, but it was clear that they, they mm. were the front line, the British, alongside the French. Mm. We know why, everything politically, we know, was to keep a good effort to stop the system, bank system, and the investment he was doing in China. So they chose the black uh, president of America to couple Africa independence. And that was the real reason why they had to remove Gaddafi. Mm. But apart from that, now they don't acknowledge even the, the, the situation which is there, which is a political responsibility. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that probably is political responsibility. And even beyond that, you know, these are human beings in the most desperate situations. And uh, it's, it's a complete travesty of the principle of humanity for us not to be doing more to assist them and to looking to places like Australia for potential models who where you know immigrants are shipped and and their um, duties under the refugee convention to process asylum applications are outsourced to other countries and um, detained for years without any prospect of re release um, I think it's it's really desperate and I think in the history of humankind this will be looked back on as um, with real disgrace and shame. Do think art should not be a mirror of what's going on in the world? Mm. Actually, but should go beyond. And they, of course, they deal with different matter. Art is about the future, possibility which are not that yet. Not about to reflect mm. the horrendous world we live in. <laughs> Mainly. Oh, because if we have the mirror, we can lead. It's not political in that sense, art. It should not be involved, no moral in that sense either. Mm. I'm not <laughs> mm. May I add just to that? Because yeah. um, <laughs> one thing I always tell my students at the start of their human rights studies is that um, if one is going to have. Um, the audacity, the arrogance to try and improve human rights in this world. Yeah? Um, you probably have to believe that your, heart, your glass is half full rather than half empty. Because if we... The recognition of how much harm is being done to fellow human beings should inspire us. But we have to recognise that human rights was born out of fear of what humankind could do to each other. Mm. But it's actually all mm. about hope that together human rights suggests a simple global ethic that all that we do to design societies, democracy, laws, systems of power, it's a very complicated world. Human rights says we will place right at the heart of that one very, very simple but profound belief. The belief that every member of the human family is born equal in dignity and rights. And from that really simple and profound belief, you can suddenly reach out and understand why we should be concerned about the violations that are indeed going on in Mexico right now, mm. what is going on in the Mediterranean, but also what is going on right here at home. Yeah, right here at home, we, have, we live amongst um, terrible situations of human rights denial with, for example, people with mental health challenges who are routinely, routinely deprived of their human rights. So, if you like, it's not about trying to find the places that are worse. It's about understanding human rights connects all of us together in a common journey that together um, we can demand justice for every member of the human family. I think that's a good place to end, yeah. no? Very good. Very good. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you.